So here we see an article from CNBC titled Mark Cuban, I have close to a billion dollars in Amazon stock. Now this is from 2019. And if we jump over to Seeking Alpha, we can see that in 2019, Amazon stock was around $1,600. And since then, the stock has doubled, meaning that Mark Cuban's position today could be double that amount and closer to $2 billion. If we scroll down, we can see that Amazon is Mark Cuban's biggest holding. And knowing Mark Cuban, he doesn't like to sell stocks that he still believes in, and he still believes in this company. So if I had to guess, Mark Cuban has not sold a single share of Amazon at this point. And jumping over to the financials of Amazon, it's easy to make sense of why he loves Amazon. Looking at the revenues, we can see year over year they have huge, huge jumps in revenue every single year. In 2016, $135 billion in revenue, all the way to last year with $386 billion in revenue. 2020 was very kind to Amazon. Everybody and their mother was buying things online because they didn't want to go to stores, so that makes sense. So I wouldn't be surprised if next year these revenues maybe took a little bit of a decline, but year over year, I think we're going to continue to see these revenues grow. One thing that Amazon has really focused on over the past couple of years is net income. They want to bring in more cash so that they have more capital to work with. We can see that in 2016 with $2 billion about in net income, all the way to last year with $21 billion in net income. This has been a strong focus for Amazon over the past couple of years. Before we jump on to the next stock, I did want to jump over here. This is a nice breakdown of Amazon's revenues, um, and we can see where they're continuing to grow. With the biggest one being about 50%, that is, of course, their online stores. This is the Amazon that everybody knows. So from June 2019 to June 2020, $163 billion in revenue just from their online stores. Their next biggest revenue source was third-party selling services, coming in at about 20% or $63 billion. This is where Amazon makes money by charging commission and shipping fees um, for people that sell things on their service. And one of the more exciting and high-growing portions of their business is the Amazon Web Services portion, coming in at 12.4% of their revenue, or $40 billion. This is where Amazon offers cloud-based services like storage, analytics, and AI. And this is going to be one of the bigger portions of their business in the next few years. And then we can see here down below some of the smaller sources of revenue, uh, comparatively speaking, $17 billion in other, which is like their credit card services, $17 billion in their physical stores, uh, or 5.3% of their revenues, and then $22 billion coming from subscription services, basically Amazon Prime, which can be another huge source of income for them in the future. And looking at things like this, where Amazon just bought MGM a few weeks ago, they are looking to be a strong competitor in that space. So I think we can continue to see this portion of their revenue continue to grow, and I'm most excited for this part and their Amazon Web Services portion of their business. And like I said earlier, Mark Cuban's positions are not public, so we have to operate all through interviews like this. This one's also from 2020, and he's talking about which stocks are his buys, sells, and holds. Scrolling down, we can see here again that Mark Cuban sold out of a lot of his positions last year as he thought they were overvalued. Um, but here's the ones he kept. Two of the positions that I kept were Amazon and Netflix. But that brings us into the second biggest holding in Mark Cuban's portfolio, Netflix. Going over to Netflix, I'm not going to cover this one too much in depth because I recently made a video on Netflix, so I will be sure to link that up above. So if you want to watch that one after this one, feel free to do that. But everybody knows what Netflix does. They make content as a streaming service and people pay to watch that content. It's a rather simple business model and that's one of the reasons why I also invest in Netflix. It's something that everybody can understand um, and they're also a great company. They're the leading they are definitely leading the world in streaming services, and that's why that's the type of company you want to invest in. Looking at their revenues, they've grown from eight billion in 2016 to 24 billion last year. Of course, with last year being quite an outlier, um, a lot of people were home and did things like watch Netflix or watch Disney Plus. So that could inflate the numbers from last year, but I think we're going to have a strong sense of growth again this year as well. Like I said, if you want to see more on Netflix, be sure to watch that other video after this one. Um, but here's Mark Cuban on why he likes Netflix right now. First, you know, they're, what, $145 billion market cap. You know, is that a legitimate market cap for the second biggest and best media company in the world after Disney? And I think it is. And two, I think all, all the trends are going 
in their favor more so than their competitors. So, for instance, Netflix is global. And if you look at what's happened in the technology world with deep fakes, you're going to see um, content, movies, videos, etc., go from being dubbed and closed captioned to looking like everything spoken in the native language over the next five years. And you're going to be able to back update a lot, not all, but a lot of your, your libraries. Being global and having that technology is going to be a huge advantage for Netflix. So that, that's part one. Part two, in terms of um, smart TVs, every single new smart TV that comes out has Netflix as an option. Heck, you go into the gym, every smart workout device has Netflix as an option. Every, you know, it's ubiquitous, not just here, but it's becoming more ubiquitous, um, it's becoming more ubiquitous globally as well. And so I think those are two key trends that work in their favor, and I don't see their competition negatively impacting that um, at all. One important thing to note, though, was that interview was from 2019, and of course in 2020 they had tremendous growth yet again, partially um, due to the situation we had last year. But Mark Cuban had said that Netflix was second fiddle to Disney at that time. But at this point, Netflix subscribers vastly outnumber those who watch Disney+. Plus. So I think that's something important to keep in mind um, for the future as well. So jumping back to this article from Newsweek, we can see here that Mark Cuban last year bought some Live Nation and some Twitter. Now, I don't really know what Live Nation is. I'm not going to cover that one. But I do want to cover Twitter because it's something that we all know. Remember, this is from last year, but Mark Cuban had said, I think all social media will suffer from soft ad sales, but Twitter will uniquely build their audience during this period and will outperform their peers when digital advertising comes back. Let's jump over to the revenues and see how true that was. Looking over the past five years, we can see that the revenue growth for Twitter has been somewhat lackluster, but I still think Mark Cuban is correct in saying that Twitter will be the future of advertising. Something to note at this current time is that Twitter is off some of their all-time highs of around $77 and currently trade for around $60. So if you see them going back up there, now might be a great time to buy. But currently I'm not investing in Twitter unless I can see that revenue growth sort of jump up faster than it has been. Twitter just hasn't had the kind of revenue growth that I personally want to see in a company that I'm investing in. Only about $300 million to $500 million per year. For a company the size of Twitter, I feel like th that should be a greater number than it is. Um, so if I can see some, start to see some year-over-year -year growth higher than what it currently is, then I would consider investing into Twitter. But it's definitely one that's on my radar. All right, now that we got into Mark Cuban's top three stocks, I also wanted to look at his cryptocurrency mindset because he also loves investing into cryptocurrencies and sees them being the future of finance. So in this article from 2021, this is Mark Cuban on what he looks for when comparing blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Here Cuban says that most people look at speed and cost compared to Bitcoin or Ethereum. While those things can be important, I look at blockchains as networks with development platforms via smart contracts. And then we can move on to see that Cuban is referring to the capabilities of each blockchain beyond speed and cost of cryptocurrency transactions. Each blockchain, which is a decentralized digital ledger that documents cryptocurrency transactions and other information, is unique. For example, the Ethereum blockchain can execute smart contracts, which power decentralized applications like DeFi or decentralized finance and NFTs or non-fungible tokens. The Ethereum blockchain features its cryptocurrency other, but can also work as a platform for other digital coins. Basically, what Cuban is saying is that he thinks Ethereum can have different forms of revenue other than just providing value as a coin. Jumping over to the next article from Motley Fool, Cuban has said in the past that 60% of his crypto is in Bitcoin, 30% in Ethereum, and 10% in other coins. I don't know how accurate this is, but I do know that from past um, interviews and articles, this sounds like a pretty accurate assumption. So those are the biggest positions in Mark Cuban's portfolio. Let me know what you think about his positions down below in the comments. Do these positions make sense or are you invested in, in any of them yourself? Be sure to let me know. Also, of course, leave a like and consider subscribing so you never miss another video like this. Other than that, thank you for watching and this is Gardner Investing.